This is Eleanor Hospice in Gravesend, one of Kent's busiest hospices. A registered charity, Eleanor provides treatment to over 2,500 people, requiring care and support right across the county. The care that they deliver is free for people of all ages. 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. I have my own little motto, and it's live life hard and fast and every day as if it's your last. You know, life is precious. When people realise they have a shorter time than they thought was likely, actually every moment matters. Their 200 strong staff and 600 volunteers are dedicated to making people's remaining days the best they can be. It's about just letting that person just leave the ward with dignity and respect. I'm sure every nurse in profession cares, but there's something special about hospice. Hi. Hi. Eleanor also take their support and treatment right into people's homes. <laughs> to have a really good cry is amazing. <laughs> you may think a hospice is a place people come to die. Some people think as soon as you say the word hospice, that's the end of the road. But it's actually a place people come to live. There's a huge amount to offer. It is full of fun. It is full of laughter. You need to live life to the full. You don't know what's around the corner. So let's make the most of what we've got. A major weather emergency has been declared today as the beast from the east makes its way across the UK. Motorists have been warned to take extra care on the roads and forecasters say that the snow and icy conditions could cause severe travel disruptions throughout the week. It's all almost eerily quiet today. Um, we're not used to this, and I don't like it when it's like this. Unfortunately, we've had to cancel um, day therapy simply because um, a lot of the patients come in um, through the volunteer drivers or, in, or on the minibus. Obviously, we have to think about the safety of the patients and, of course, of the drivers. Obviously, I like it when it's noisy because it's um, a hub of activity, and so um, today is un it's exceptionally quiet. With the beast from the east heading their way, the support team at Eleanor have received a call for help from an elderly woman whose late husband was a former patient at the hospice. We had a call today from one of our patients whose boiler had broken down. She phoned in here in a distressed state because unfortunately she's also just recently lost her husband at Christmas time. She's worried about being on her own and coping with something breaking down and not know, just not knowing what to do. We've got two heaters at the hospice. We can bring it to your house. Will that help? For you, don't get yourself upset. For you, we'll do anything. All right, lovey? Don't, don't, don't cry. Don't get upset. You're not alone. We're here and we'll come out and see you. And there'll be somebody called Sally who will be with, with you for a short while, OK? You just make sure you put that kettle on. Right, Tracy's going to take you. Mm -hmm. And you got the address? She's ready to go now. Yeah. yeah, I'll take it. Lovely. With weather conditions worsening, family support worker Sally and head of support services Tracy set off on a 16 mile round trip through snow and ice to deliver their precious cargo of electric heaters. She, she's quite distressed, though, obviously, not only with the cold, but she's recently lost her husband only two months ago at Christmas time. So she's on her own 99% of the time, I think. She hasn't um, been with us under our service for, for a while, actually. And I, I'm really proud that, in one way, that she thought of us first. Um, you know, it's nice to know that, that although she hasn't been in contact with us for a little while, we yeah. were foremost in her mind, you know, someone that was there to help her. So, you know, that means we're doing the right job and we're doing a good job. Right, we're out of, running out of roads, looking at this. I think we have to get out. And... We are out of houses. The support Eleanor offers to patients and their families doesn't end when that patient dies. The hospice does its best to provide ongoing care to loved ones wherever possible. Run out of numbers. <laughs> Hello. All right, my lovey. 
Oh, let me take my boots off, my love. Bless your heart. This is kind of above and beyond. If we're asked uh, by a family, we think it's feasible. Um, you know, so especially if somebody's on their own. In fact, what I was going to suggest is, you know, we could have bought like some hot soup or something like that. So I don't know whether she's eat, been able to eat. Oh, we're just coming to get those. Due to the bad weather, the team at Eleanor have enlisted the help of a local volunteer via a Facebook shout-out to provide transport for Dr B, a new doctor starting her first shift at the hospice today. There's a new doctor arriving today, her name's Dr B, and it's really important that we make her feel really welcome and make her feel part of the team here at Eleanor. So we've prepared an induction programme for her and that will enable her to meet all key people throughout the organisation and give her a really good understanding of the care that we provide here at Eleanor. The hospice environment is massively different to the work that Dr B has been doing in a busy A and E department. Um, I think when people first join us they have the perception that hospice care is it's really quiet and at a really slow pace um, and it doesn't take them long to actually realise because of the type of work we do and the care that we offer that actually it's really really busy but in a very very different way. So Dr B has come to us with experience in working in a variety of settings including A&E and elderly care medicine. All of that experience will be useful and put her in a really good stead to actually um, make a great start here in her medical career at Eleanor. Hi Habiba. Hello. Hi, hi. how are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm good. A Welcome bit. to the no, team. Thank uh, you. We're really excited to have you on board. Uh, just a few things I will have a you know, just to give you a little bit of an idea what we do in hospice and how it works. Okay. Uh, which is pretty much straightforward and I'm sure that once you start your training, it will take you maybe one or two days to get familiarised and you should be fine. Okay. It can be kind of extremely distressing for the patients and the families. This yeah. is not one of the specialities where you could just say halfway through, you, you know, half-hearted that, okay, let me continue, no. Yeah, you yeah. will get to know very quickly in the next few weeks. And if it's for you. Exactly. If you are really going to pursue as a career. And right. I become useful. <laughs> Absolute, absolutely. Oh, you'll be useful, trust me. You'll be fine. It's my first day here and I'm a little bit nervous because always are with a new job, really. Um, but I'm quite excited as well because this is something I'm really passionate about and interested in after working in an acute setting for so long. And this is going to sound very cliche, but dying is such an important part of life and we shy away from it. Um, and we shy away from dealing with difficult things. It's never talked about with some people, but I want to be there to make it seem OK. I want to be there to allow people to have some sort of normality back into their life in a situation that can sometimes seem hopeless. The difference with working in a hospice is knowing that sometimes that patient that you're caring for is actually going to die and sometimes that's why they're here for. Um, and I think what's going to... I'm going to have to put on a different hat where I, I don't just go, actually, this is your problem and this is how it's managed. I need to go, this is your problem, how would you like it managed? These are your choices, really. Because if you don't do that, then it's just robotic. You, you need a human there. You need a person understanding just holding your hand if you need to. And we shouldn't lose that ever. I didn't lose it in any, and I sure won't lose it now. After being referred from a local hospital, a new patient is arriving at Eleanor. This is Andreas. I know, it's a bit different from the hospital. Yeah. Okay, much more chilled, much more relaxed. This is Andreas. Andreas, we just said you might want to be called Andy. Yes. Andy. There we are. Ah, <laughs> well done. So, if you just sit there, I'll get you a nice chair. Pochodzę z Polski, z Gorzowa Wielkopolskiego. To jest po prostu rak. Zjada mnie od, od środka. Na jedną nerkę już mi usunęli. No, teraz jest przerzut na drugą nerkę i na kość. Także 
nie wesoło jest ze mną, ale jakoś jeszcze jest. Okay. Oh. Better. Yes. Can I get you a cup of tea or a glass of water or uh, coffee? Tea, please. Tea? tea. Sugar? Why? Przyjechałem tutaj 13 lat temu. Tak, no, ja pracowałem jako, na, na początku pracowałem jako na farmie. Później zacząłem się zajmować budowlanką. No, dosyć dobrze się zarabiało, było gdzie mieszkać. No a później właśnie ta choroba jak mi dopadła, także straciłem pracę. Tam gdzie nie idzie, tylko dorywczo jako podjąłem jakąś pracę, ale nie starczało mi na opłaty mieszkań. No i byłem jako bezdomny. Tak się skończyło. No myślę, że będzie tak samo jak i w szpitalu było. Że opieka w szpitalu była dobra. Tak samo podejrzewam, że i tutaj będzie na pewno, bo widzę po pielęgniarkach, są miłe. Over in the hospice's on-site kitchen, catering assistant Charlotte is preparing a special meal for Polish patient Andy. And we want to make him as comfortable as possible, uh, so we're trying to look for some Polish traditional recipes that we think maybe he might like uh, or we can offer to him. So I found a courgette pâté. Um, it's a vegetarian's dream, a traditional Polish recipe. Got yes. So we might give that one a try. I'm sure it would be nice if he can see that we're offering something he might recognise. It looks like they use a lot of pork in their dishes. But I don't think we've got... Uh, I think we've only got joints of pork in. We're going to try the courgette pâté, which is a traditional Polish dish. Um, also a Polish rice pudding cake. We're going to bake that as well and see how that goes. Hopefully that will go down well. With Kent in the grip of a snowstorm, hospice support team members Sally and Tracy are returning from a rescue mission, delivering electric heaters to an elderly lady. Oh, at least she's a little bit warmer. Yes, yes, that's good. I'm less distressed, I feel. Absolutely. Oh, dear. <laughs> That's what it's all about, isn't it? Coming together when it's like this. It is indeed. It's all encompassing, really. You, you you look at everything, not just the medical condition. You look at things that affect their everyday lives, including like getting heaters to people that haven't got heat, and <laughs> you know that's what you do. The house was extremely cold, and bless her, she was very, very cold. She was wearing jumpers and dressing gowns to keep herself warm. We've um, managed to put the heaters on for her, and immediately she said she's found some relief from that. I had a good chat with her, um, because she did used to come to our day therapy for a while, but unfortunately her husband became more poorly. I suggested to her that perhaps she might rethink and come back again, just even if it's once a week and she'll have a hot meal provided for her and make friends. I do find it very rewarding because you make a difference and that's what this job is, making a difference. Eleanor arrange regular training courses for their staff. Today, some of the team are taking part in a CPR workshop. One of the courses we've got arranged today is for cardiac pulmonary resuscitation, or CPR for short. And although we are a hospice and we do not resuscitate people, a general rule, we still have visitors that come in, members of the public, and also patients that come in for symptom control and are still for active treatment. So you've still got to give them that chance. So actually just lift at the elbow. That's it. And then put your okay. ear there. As a registered nurse, you have to attend mandatory CPR courses every year to be staying on a register. 
cardiac pulmonary resuscitation is reviewed every year according to the results that they have, the success result. So it's very, very important for nurses to upskill themselves and to maintain their up-to-date knowledge. Meanwhile, the Eleanor's newest physician, Dr B, is having a welcome meeting with Director of Patient Care, Jackie. Right, so also looking after you personally, um, we have support mechanisms in place, so there'll be one-to-ones, which I think going forward would be good with Dr um, Shiraz, because working here can be really emotionally demanding yeah. um, and we need to look after our staff, so that's in place for all staff. Um, and equally, should you need it at any point, there is a confidential counselling service. But obviously, I would hope that if you were finding things a bit tough, you'd be able to talk to us, because I'd hate you to sort of struggle. One of the things I'm quite nervous about is dealing with the younger population, with children. And I think that's going to be quite an emotional thing for me. That's one of the things I'm, I think I'm going to struggle with. And I think the only thing I can do for that is accept that I'm human. And it's probably a good thing I might have a little cry or, you know, give someone a cuddle and really feel what they're feeling. Right, so what I'll do is I'll give you a tour of the building now. Lovely. This is Habiba, who's Hello. our new doctor. This Hello. is Habiba, our new doctor. So we're just doing a tour of the building. This is Habiba, so it's her first day. Hello. Sorry, you'll glaze over soon. <laughs> All these names. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Um, this is Habiba, who's just joined us today. Habiba's our new doctor. This is Habiba. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Lovely Welcome. Meet Welcome. You. So, uh, Hello. This is Habiba. Habiba's our new doctor. Everyone has been so lovely. There's some really kind souls about. Even the way people greet you, it's so warm. So it's your first day here? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant stuff. And how are you feeling? Quite comfortable? I am, actually. And I'm so used to starting a new job and just getting on. With it. Sure. Do you know what I mean? But here it's very much like, oh, we'll, yeah, we'll introduce you to everyone and, and make you feel warm and welcome. And I'm like, yeah. oh, OK. <laughs> and see all the different departments. Yeah, which is, is so important, it's though. Yeah. yeah, it is good to see how, the, how it all works and how it all moves. But yeah. there's a lot to take in, isn't there? Yeah. It's well, a great place to work. It is. Yeah, I, can so, have, I can see that already. Yeah, yeah it's it'd be interesting to see what your journey is going, how it's going to unfold and, yeah. and what's going to happen. But it'd be great working with you. Thank you. I'm looking yeah. forward to it with you too. Just call me Ben. I will do. <laughs> Not Father you. Ted. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to meet you. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Two weeks ago, cancer patient Karen and her husband Gary came to Eleanor to speak with senior nurse Angela about how they're dealing with Karen's illness. After finding it difficult to cope with her condition at home, Karen has since been admitted to the inpatient ward for symptom control. I'm just about to go and see Karen, uh, who I saw on Monday, um, to catch up because I heard from the ward nurses that she wanted to go home yesterday. And I'm a bit worried to find out what her concerns are. From the moment I met you, um, I just felt a connection. It just seems that you've been on this journey from the beginning with Gary and I. Um, I think more so to start with with Gary because I think you picked up on how he was struggling. It's when the communication breaks down between the couples and we meet them individually and they express how they feel, a uh, wife struggling, wanting to know how her husband's going to cope and the children are going to cope. And then we hear from the husband about how the wife's fears of dying and how they feel in, inadequate and not able to help them. And the worst thing is to see a loved one go through pain and suffering and not being able to help. But I just can't help feeling a little bit bitter sometimes, especially at this time of our lives when, you know, we were just doing a little bit of planning and going to go travelling. We had our children young, we've saved hard, and we was just going to go on some adventures. Um, we was trying as much as possible to, to shelve all of this, but it just has a way of not allowing you to. I notice that you're very worried about him. What about you? We're both worried about each other. You are? Um, I'm absolutely petrified of 
um, what the next stage will be. I don't want this to be my final stage at all. I really want to go home. And I know that's not the place for me at the moment, but in my heart, I just want to be there. We come across that because home is a place of safety. And if you're at home, nothing bad is going to happen to you. Can we, both of us, cope with me being at home? That's, that's, um, okay. that's the sensible side. The irrational side says, get me home now, because then I'm, I'm running away from this situation. And I just, I know there are so many people here, so many people, I just feel so lonely. So lonely. As soon as he goes out, out, of, out of the door, I just feel that there's such a big part of me missing. Because, I don't know, we've been together for 40 years, and, well, over 40 years. I've had three beautiful children. I've met all my grandchildren. I've told them they better not have any more because I won't get to meet them. Oh. That's a joke. That's a joke, and they know it is. You know, and we've created some wonderful, wonderful memories over the last year, but that doesn't mean that I don't feel angry, I don't feel bitter with the world sometimes. When two people love one another so much, they don't want to hurt one another, but there are things that need to be said. And it's quite not quite the time yet, but we can help. He knows I love him. It shows. There's no avoiding it. You try and pretend that you're a senior nurse and it doesn't affect you, but it does. It does affect you. Sorry. With snow falling outside Elena Hospice, senior nurse Angela is catching up with cancer patient Karen, who lately has been feeling homesick and lonely. Would you say that you're frightened of dying? Yes, I am. What is it about dying that you're frightened of? Um, I suppose... Um, I suppose being in, being in pain it's OK to talk to one another about death and dying. It's OK to cry. It's OK to laugh. You know, it's, it, you need to do that because a lot of things can go unsaid. Do you feel that this admission is going to be the end for you? I hope not, but I'm scared. Yeah. I, I don't want it to be. Okay. I really don't want it to be, and I'm fighting, um, as you know, just just so much, not only the illness that has progressed, but, you know, with the shingles and other things that we discuss. On top of everything yeah. else, roast and fresh, then, yeah. shall we? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what else? Oh, dear. dear. Oh, that's the funny side of you, guys. I think I need to... Have a little board so I can keep everyone updated <laughs> today. What's the disease for today? Yeah. What's the symptom for today? Yeah. Today I'm, you know, the other way oh, and yeah. I've got thrush and, yeah. <laughs> That's the core, is having that trust with someone and making it, you can't cure them, making the journey less bumpy, more comfortable. And that's what job satisfaction is in palliative care. Take care, love you. Thank you. Bye bye. Mm. Thank you. With the snow still falling, Eleanor's nursing team are making sure they're well prepared for the worsening weather conditions. So the weather's coming in really thick and fast now. We have no idea what's going on with public transport from one minute to the next. The roads, we haven't got any idea what they're going to be like from hour to hour. Both of us are due on a clinical shift on the ward tomorrow and we're not sure if all the staff are going to be able to get in. 
So as a precaution, Julie and I are going to spend the night here, having a sleepover. So, so we're here if they can't get in? Yeah. So why are we going now? Over to Morrison's to buy some knickers. We need clean underwear. <laughs> we do. And maybe some midnight snacks. Yeah, maybe some midnight snacks, yeah. yeah. Oh. It's a bit nippy, isn't it? So I phoned up Andy. Oh, yeah. And I told him that I was uh, staying at the hospice tonight. Yeah. And he said, what about my dinner? I'm sure they'll survive one night. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. they will. Right, what are we getting? Fruit? Yeah. Fruit. Raspberries. Strawberries. Because we're on Slimming World. Yeah. Yeah, we're on a mission. So our midnight feast will be fruit. Oh, they're dull. Let's we go. need chocolate and wine, really, no, don't, don't we? Wine? <laughs> we don't wine. Is Pringles on Slimming World? No, definitely You're not. You sure? Yeah, I'm certain. There's more teasers on Slimming no. World. <laughs> Leave them alone. <laughs> They've got knickers now. That's the women's ones. Fine. Women's essentials. Okay. We're going to pick up H10. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Got your nicks? Yep, got my nicks. Do we need socks? We're not sleeping naked. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't normally do this at all, but because of the weather, you know, it's just making sure everything's okay. I do snore, yeah. by the way. Oh. Yeah, no, it is exciting, yeah. You just make the best of it, don't you? At Eleanor Hospice, resident physiotherapist Andy Loden is preparing for the arrival of one of his patients. Today, Andy's meeting Jim, who last year underwent surgery and radiotherapy to remove a tumour in his neck. What's nice is getting to know my patients and getting to know what it is that that floats their boat and our aim for Jim is to get him to be able to go to the New Forest when they've got a holiday in May. Um, so that's our target, work towards that, build up his endurance, get him just feeling a bit more physically fit. Okay, can you just straighten this leg out for me? I just want you to keep that nice and straight and just stop me from pushing it down, push up against me, perfect. Good, and now push down against me, push, perfect. So an excellent, strong set of legs there. Those are legs that have done a lot of country walking, that's for sure. They've been around the New Forest a few times, right? We talk about their physical issues, but along with that comes a lot of emotional issues as well, where they might not have thought about how it's impacting them on their independence, how it's impacting on the things that they can do, how it's impacting on their life. And when we start to talk about that, there's still a lot of issues for him. and that's making him feel quite emotionally drained. I think he thought he was at the end of his journey and actually there's still a few more chapters to run. He's been through a huge ordeal last year, major surgery, um, received some radiotherapy. However, he's in really great physical shape, which sounds strange for a man who's uh, just recovering from cancer, but actually his strength is good, his balance is good, his coordination is good, which um, we don't see a lot of that here at Eleanor. We, we tend to deal with the palliative condition side of things. And actually for him, we're aiming for a cure. Lovely to meet you. Okay, You're more than welcome. Thank you very much. Right, I'll see you in a month. Yeah. Yeah. Do those exercises, I'm always watching. Over on the inpatient ward, new hospice staff member Dr B is on her way to meet her first patient, Andy. I'm just about to go see Andy. He is a new patient, a Polish gentleman. Andy is actually here for social reasons. He is homeless currently. Um, I've heard that where he was living, he had prescription painkillers uh, stolen from him. It's almost a, a place of protection for him right now. Also, the nature of his condition means that he could deteriorate at any point. So I think he just needs a lot of support and kindness from us right now. I'm B. I'm one of the doctors here. Um, you've just come from Darren's Valley, yes. the big hospital. Do you know what you're doing here? Do you know why you're here? Yeah, yeah. OK. Well, why, why are you here? I don't know. <laughs> OK. It's a little bit speak English. Uh... You find it difficult to say what you want in English? OK. As soon as we can, we'll get an interpreter. And then you can give us a big list of everything you need and we can try and help you really, okay. as best we can. Um, 
So I hear they've got food sorted for you. Yeah? How's your mood, your feeling? No problem. No pain. No pain. A little bit. It's, it's, it's OK. Are you happy? Are you sad? One day is happy, one day is... Up and down? Yeah. OK. Well, we're definitely here for you if you need to talk with someone and just get you feeling more up than down. No, up, up. Up, definitely. <laughs> up. Yeah, OK, so that's what we're here for. I think this man's actual problems now are more social and psychological, and sometimes that's what people need, is support in that way. And he seems so grateful for just being here, um, and that's really, really touching, because I think now in healthcare, people can take so much for granted. Um, so being in a place like this where someone appreciates just your time, that's amazing. Scale. With their new pants purchased, Sue and Julie head back to the hospice. I'm glad I'm not going home now. Bye, girls. Let me go around there. I'll slip over. OK, let's brave this weather. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Hi, ladies, we're back. And we're all set. Oh. Knickers, socks, deodorant. Nice. <laughs> all is good in the world. Yeah, we've got new knickers. Nice, Sue. Thank you. That is absolutely. Oh, it's blizzard really, out there. Really deep snow coming down out there. Yeah, yeah it's really that yeah. bad, honestly. We're going to go and bay one and two. Yeah. In fact, should we go put our bits in there? Yeah. Might as well. Yeah, let's do it. Let's get well, settled for the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll do. We will. So this is where the room we shall sleep in tonight. I want this bed. I was going to say you can have the window, it's chillier. Yeah. And I'll be here. So this will be us for the night. Yeah. This is what I'll be using to hoist Julie out when she needs a wee in the middle of the night. I can walk, thank Julie, you. Julie, I'm qualified. I can, do, I can look after <laughs> you, it's all right. It's, it's just what we do, isn't it? Our patients are our priority. So it's not about being committed, it's and about... colleagues. Yeah. So it's just about the place needs to keep going and we're happy to do it. And so we'd rather our colleagues be safe than try and struggle and get in. Yeah, that's bad out there now, isn't it? I've put buzzers on the bed, so if we need a cup of tea the night, our colleagues can bring us a cup of tea. I think that's a really good idea, yeah, actually. Yeah, we should do yeah, that, yeah, definitely. Yeah. They'll be in here with us. Yeah. We'll be saying to them, please, we need some sleep. Yeah, leave us alone. Yeah, leave us alone. Yeah. No, it's going to be fine. It's going to be a good night. Well, nothing can defeat the Eleanor. No. Not at all. We're here and, and we do We're what we do. We're for the patients. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a bit of snow's not going to bother us. As long as we've got clean knickers. <laughs> <laughs>Six weeks ago, Jill arrived at Eleanor Hospice with a terminal brain tumour. Sadly, after spending just five days in the hospice, Jill passed away. Jill's sister Jane has been referred to voluntary counsellor Dawn to discuss how Eleanor's counselling service could help her through this difficult time. I've been a voluntary counsellor here longer than I've actually worked here. My thoughts were, well, what if I can help someone deal with something that they've never dealt with in their life before, ever. And that was what gave me the kind of passion to want to be able to help people. Jane came in uh, sometime this week to meet Angela. And um, after meeting Angela, um, it was um, suggested that she would come for an assessment for counselling. What we'll do in that assessment is just ascertain to see what support that she needs. Jane, could you just give me a little bit um, of history of, your, of yourself and really what brings you to counselling uh, now? I know we've had a funeral and it was beautiful, but I still think she's going to come back. I know, oh, stupid, I know she's gone. It's not stupid. But I'm staying at her house for a little while at the minute and I was just house it for her and I feel like she's on holiday. And I, I just can't... I keep saying to myself, she's not coming back. But it's just kind not... of a bit of denial. Yeah. The day she'd been told she's got days, possibly weeks, she, within four hours of being told that she'd gone. Wow. And it wasn't 
it wasn't horrific, but it wasn't nice to watch. Mm. And and then I saw her, and to me, she was just asleep. I know she's not going to come back, but it's just it doesn't seem real. No, and and what you're experiencing, Jane, is is normal grief reactions, like denial. I say denial. Although you're kind of not in denial, but you are, your brain sort of is, mm. although you say, no, I know she's not going to come back. And the numbness, again, is something that is a normal uh, reaction, mm. you know, to loss. I have moments. And um, again, you're allowed to do yeah. that. The way I deal with grief uh, mm. will be completely different to the way that you group, uh, deal with grief and Joe Bloggs mm. deals with grief. It's kind of normal to feel like you're feeding and it and the tears mm. the tears are okay mm. the tears are okay uh, a lot of people don't actually think that it's okay it's not okay to cry of course it's okay to cry i mean jane knew her sister for a long time so it's not gonna sort of like get to the acceptance of losing her within a few weeks it's probably going to take her a lot longer than that and it's okay to feel all those things numbness maybe waiting for Jill to walk back through the door. It, it's normal stuff and, and I think Jane will get to the, the stage of realising that that's okay. During their morning briefing earlier today, Carol from the day therapy team highlighted a patient named Roy and his wife Denise, who she thinks could benefit from some respite care on the inpatient ward. Roy has a severe neurological condition which has left him immobile. Just by accident, I bumped into Denise um, in a supermarket um, with Roy and they were just going to have a coffee together and I sort of went over and said hello to her and was amazed that she'd sort of still trying to carry on and do the normal things in life that um, couples like to do. And then she said something which really hit home to me was, she said, my husband died a long time ago, although she loves him dearly and that comes across so strongly. But I think when you've looked after someone for 10 years, you become their carer and not their, their wife or their husband. And although that's sad, um, I just applaud her for what she does for him. She's always refused any care. They don't have a care package and how she manages him is beyond me. I don't know, because we, we struggle really. When he comes into day therapy, it takes two of us. And the fact that she's accepting some help is a huge breakthrough, the way I see it. She was going to be able to bring him in herself, but now due to the snow, it sounds as though he's going to need an ambulance. No, I think that's entirely appropriate. Yeah. What I would recommend is that because of the snow situation, we don't know how, when is he going to get in here. If we can get the list of medication from, from the wife, yes. so what I could do is even if he turns up late, at least his drug chart will be done. Do you think his wife's going to want to stay? No, she realises that the benefit of the respite is not for her to stay with yeah. him. And I think she will find that a bit of a wrench, but she is quite local, so she'll be able to get back and, back and forth. Okay. So you mm. happy to go and I'll give go her a ring then? Her. OK. Okay. Yeah, great. All right, okay. lovely. Thank you, Polly. Thank you. Okay. I think, you know, despite the fact that it's snowing, um, we still were determined to get him here um, because who knows what tomorrow is going to bring. It could be worse weather tomorrow um, or Roy could suddenly deteriorate, not be well enough to transport tomorrow. So um, um, a little bit of snow is not going to put us off and we'll still fight to get him here some, some way. Hi, Denise. It's me again. <laughs> if you're happy to go ahead, um, one of my colleagues is about to um, contact the transport, the ambulance service, to bring him in. We've got, I mean, it's not too bad at the moment. Let's just give it a try, yes? And if they can't, they can't. The thing is, it's the first time he's ever come onto the ward and, and I think it's going to be... Um, it's going to be good for you, as well as Roy, you know. She never, ever feels sorry for herself. She, she said, this is, this is what she said to me today, was, this is what you do. You, you do your best for someone and you try not to let it get you down because if you did, then 
then what would you do? You'd just be so depressed. So she tries to make the best of each and every day that she has, because as I said, who knows what tomorrow will bring. OK, well, don't, don't worry too much. Don't worry. They'll, they've, they've obviously transported other people in snowy conditions. And, and he can go home whenever you want him to, you know. He doesn't have to stay a set amount of time. All right then, Denise, so we'll see you a bit later on. Um, look forward to seeing you. Take care. Bye for now. It has been a challenge trying to bring this gentleman in today, but that's what we're here to do. It's really important for this patient's wife, who is caring for him full-time on her own, that she has a break from that caring role so that she can then carry on doing that into the future. The last thing we want is that she becomes ill and then she ends up in hospital and he ends up in hospital too. So it's really important we get this gentleman in here today so his wife can have that little bit of a break and then he can go home and she can carry on caring for him. Snowman. <laughs> <laughs> this is so beautiful. <laughs> right, that's it, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a rubbish throw. <laughs> oh, that's it, I'm done. It seems a really silly question I'm going to ask you next, but what is it that you hope to gain from counselling? Just being able to accept mm -hmm. and get on with things, hopefully, and try and me try and get back to how I was before. How were you before? I could concentrate better. <laughs> um, I've always been quite jolly, and people expect me to be jolly all the time, because here comes Jane. And I try, and I, I do have my moments, and, but sometimes I don't want to be jolly Jane. I want to be left alone. And, you know, people joke with me all the time. Sometimes now I think, I just want to be on my own. OK. Don't. Did you feel like that before? No, not, not, not very often. Sometimes you just have, like, a bad day. So I just want to get back to being me as much as I can. So, Jolly Jane is me. Yeah, yeah, Jolly. Yeah, I think I am quite jolly. Everybody gets out of counselling what they need to get out of counselling. Um, so, I believe that we can we can help everybody get to a stage they need to be. Some people think that they're coping okay. The bravest step, I think, is for a client to actually say, actually, I think I do need counselling. I think I need some help. And that's the toughest part. I think is for clients to actually admit that. A little bit lost. Yeah. Me is, is me lost. Um, yeah, because me is for everyone else. They're always telling me you should do more, Mum. Get out more, because I don't really do anything. Um, and that's not how I used to be. So from, from the counselling course, you're hoping to um, find yourself again? Yeah. Yeah, find, find me somewhere and um, just more acceptance about Jill. She said to me she thinks you know, she might be going mad, but it isn't that at all. Um, it's just normal stuff that you'd be feeling. Like, so not too long after you've um, lost a loved one. And then what we'll do now is I'll just look and see what we can do and what's the best way really to help support her and help her get her to um, a place where she can accept the, the loss of her sister. First day has been a really nice surprise. Everyone's been so kind and warm and just really willing to teach me how to do things and settle me in. It's been a lovely surprise to what I'm used to, which is just getting thrown in at the deep end with other jobs. You get to know the patient and the family. That's definitely, for me, what's going to be different and a bit more challenging and what I want to sort of rise to, really. I think that's when you, you can start 
distinguishing the hospice care from everything else that happens out there. Seeing how emotions and feelings can get revved from naught to 60 in this place. I've just felt like I, I want to be here. I want to be that person who can offer that comfort, who can offer those expertise. And like I said, the fact that your colleagues are so supportive and everyone has a, such a lovely, kind nature about them in the hospice, it just makes you want to work here, it makes you want to do well and it makes you want to do right by your patients and their families. It's a really lovely place to be. So I already love it here.